Welcome to another EduMed video, and in this video, we'll be thinking about why patients with COVID-19 are hypoxic. Now, a proviso with all of these videos about COVID-19, we are very early on in the disease process, and so we're constantly learning new things. So the things that I say here is the best of our knowledge at this point. <clears throat> Now, in order to understand why COVID-19 patients may be hypoxic, it's worth actually thinking about what oxygenation depends upon. We'll talk a little bit about the pathophysiology of COVID-19 at the alveolar level, and then talk about two specific phenotypes that seem to be delineating themselves in the COVID pathology. So, before you do these videos, it's really worth going through the basics of ventilation video series that I did, which explains in a lot more detail about the importance of the alveolar unit in oxygenation and CO2 removal. If you've watched those videos, you'll know that this picture here is the most important one, because this really shows you what is going on and the only things that we can actually affect in the lung and the things that affect both oxygenation and CO2 removal. For the purposes of this video, we'll be thinking purely op about the oxygenation of the blood. So when you think about it, there's only really two parts of the lung. There is the alveolus and the blood supply to the alveolus. The only role of the lung is to get oxygen from the air into the blood supply. And the way it does it is by bringing that oxygen into the alveolus and then letting it sit there whilst blood washes past and takes up that oxygen. As such, the only things that can really affect oxygenation are the blood supply to the lungs and ensuring that there's oxygen rich gas getting to the alveoli which are being supplied by blood. So if you have a situation whereby you have an alveolus that's full of oxygen but there's no blood getting to it, you're not going to oxygenate that blood. Similarly, if you've got a situation where you've got blood flowing through an alveolus, but that alveolus is either collapsed or full of pus and debris, and therefore not got any oxygen in it, again, you're not going to oxygenate the blood. And that's really the core concepts that I want you to bear in mind when we talk about the pathophysiology of COVID-19 and what the potential mechanisms for hypoxia could be. So when thinking about oxygenation of the blood, there's only really four things that can affect it. And that's really great from our perspective because it means there's only really four things that we can try and manipulate and affect in order to improve oxygenation of the patient. The first and most simple is the fractional inspired concentration of oxygen. So by dialing up the amount of oxygen, you want to try and improve the amount of oxygen in the alveolus. So as long as that alveolus is seeing blood, then you're going to get more diffusion of oxygen across because you've increased the diffusion gradient between the alveolus and the blood. And so you're going to get quicker diffusion of um, oxygen into the blood supply itself. The second thing is the alveolus being open. As long as that alveolus is open, whether that's in inspiration or expiration, you're going to get gas moving from the alveolus and into the blood supply. Now, one of the concepts of positive end expiratory pressure, PEEP or CPAP, is that you try and maintain alveolar recruitment throughout the respiratory cycle. Gas diffusion isn't clever. It's not going to depend upon whether the patient's inspiring or expiring gas. All that matters is that the alveolus is open. So the longer it's open for, the more time you're allowing for oxygen to diffuse into the blood supply. Alveolar blood flow is really important and something that people often forget about when thinking about the oxygenation and hypoxic patient. There's no point in having an alveolus full of oxygen if there's no blood getting to it. So this is why patients with pulmonary emboli become hypoxic. It's not necessarily that the alveolus is any problem, it's because there's no blood getting to the alveolus that's oxygenated, and that's why patients become hypoxic. On a more macroscopic level, it's always worth thinking about right ventricular function. If you don't have a good cardiac output, i.e. you don't have the right side of the heart pumping good amounts of blood out into the into the ventilated bits of lung, 
then you're not going to get adequate oxygenation. So always thinking about optimizing cardiac output, optimizing the right ventricular function is vital. There's no good having fantastic ventilation strategies if you've not optimized the cardiovascular system appropriately. And we'll talk about that in a lot more detail when thinking about the different phenotypes of the um, COVID-19 pathophysiology. And the final thing is alveolar blood interface. <clears throat> In most of our patients that we've commonly seen with things like pneumonia, this is the thing that's really affected. You get lots of pus, edema of the alveolar wall and of the vascular endothelium, and that increases the diffusion distance that the oxygen has to go through, makes it less efficient, and therefore patients start to become hypoxic. Also, you're going to be causing lots of alveolar to fill up with pus and therefore not be able to take part in oxygenation, and that's why patients become hypoxic in pneumonias. And really, this is the only four things that can affect whether a patient becomes hypoxic or not. Now, if you've seen my um, lectures on ba the basics of ventilation, you know that this is probably the most important slide when considering oxygenation, because this slide pretty much summarizes everything that you can do to improve the oxygenation um, with, of the lungs without going on to extracorporeal support with um, treatments such as ECMO. So as we said, increasing the FiO2, increasing the um, gradient of um, oxygen flowing from the alveolus into the blood supply is the easiest thing and intuitive to all of us. Another thing that you can do is actually increasing the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the blood because if you've got um, haemoglobin, that'll s store up the majority of the oxygen at normal atmospheric pressure. However, if for any reason you're anemic or the, ox or the haemoglobin itself isn't functioning well, you could think about in introducing a hyperbaric chamber. And this increases the amount of oxygen that's actually dissolved in the blood itself. We sometimes do this in severely anemic patients, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses with massive hemorrhages whilst we're waiting for the um, patient's body to create more haemoglobin. <coughs> in terms of keeping the alveolus open, there's a number of mechanical things that you can do. The simplest is giving them a pneumatic splint, and that's what positive end expiratory pressure, or CPAP, does. What it does is it keeps the, those alveoli open whilst the patient is expiring and therefore you're maximizing the amount of time that the alveolus is open and able to oxygenate the blood. Sitting the patient up might help. What this is trying to do is trying to match the areas that you're getting ventilation with perfusion. If you're sitting upright most of the blood is going to rush down into the bases. In a patient who's spontaneously ventilating, what you often find is that the majority of the ventilation occurs through movement of the diaphragm downwards, and so you get expansion of the bases. Intuitively, you know that's correct, because when you're listening to the chest, often in the apices, you don't hear much breath sounds, but then when you listen into the bases, you hear really good breath sounds. And the reason is that you're getting more aeration of the um, lower zones, in spontaneous breathing. So if you've got someone spontaneously breathing, you may be able to match their ventilation and their perfusion better by changing their position. Alternatively, if you've got a patient with severe bibasal pneumonias, lying the patient down a little bit flatter might promote more blood coming up into the middle and upper zones, which have more aeration and therefore improving the VQ matching. We will be talking a little bit about proning in future videos, but one of the theories of proning is that we're actually trying to improve the ventilation and the perfusion matching. And in COVID, this certainly seems to be an important factor. <clears throat> in terms of clever ventilation, this is things like airway pressure release ventilation. I won't go into that in any detail here, but I've done a whole series of videos introducing the concepts and I'd um, recommend you go and watch that playlist if you have time. Um, if patients have very raised intra-abdominal pressures, again, that can push up on the um, diaphragm, pushing up on the lower lobes, collapsing them. And so in some cases with significant intra-abdominal pressures, you might think about doing um, a laparotomy, opening up the abdomen and releasing that pressure. <coughs> 
Similarly, if patients have significant ascites, sometimes draining that ascites can improve ventilation. Something that's really missed, and something that's not really taught that often, is thinking about alveolar blood flow. Think about shunting, and we'll talk a lot about shunting throughout the next series of videos on COVID. We want to try and, um, ma and try and stop blood from just going from the right side of the heart into the left side of the heart without seeing an alveolus full of oxygen. And if you've got collapsed down lung, what happens is that even though the alveolus doesn't get any um, oxygen to it, the blood is still flowing through it. So it's flowing straight from the right side to the left side and not getting any oxygen and not removing any carbon dioxide. The greater the shunt fraction, the greater the hypoxia that you see because more of the blood is not being oxygenated. And the interesting thing about shunts is that it doesn't matter how much oxygen you give these patients, they're going to remain hypoxic. Why? Well, it's because the blood is flowing through areas of lung that aren't, get, aren't seeing that um, gas with the high oxygen. They're flowing through areas with collapsed alveoli or where there's not enough um, ventilation of the alveoli. So therefore, the blood is just shunting across and it's a fantastic way of seeing how much of a shunt you have by increasing up the oxygen and seeing how much the saturations or the partial pressure of oxygen actually increases. And if you've got a significant shunt, which we often do in patients with COVID, what you find is that there is no increment in um, the saturations or very little increment. And that is a bad sign and indicates that you need to do something to match the ventilation and perfusion better. Now, in normal patients, the lungs have this great ability to vasoconstrict areas that aren't getting enough oxygen, so-called hypoxic vasoconstriction. That is the body's way of trying to match the um, blood flow to the areas that are getting ventilated. So if there's hypoxic areas, what it means is that there's not enough gas getting to those areas. And so the blood doesn't need to see those bits. It needs to be diverted into areas that can see the um, higher oxygen content. Now, there's a theory in COVID that you get pulmonary dysregulation. And so these areas that are hypoxic, instead of becoming vasodilated, remain open. So you're increasing the amount of shunting through those areas. The way to think about this is, let's say you've got three litres of blood coming out of the um, right side of the heart every minute. Let's say half of the lung is not being oxygenated, it's hypoxic, and the other half is um, being oxygenated. Well, if you don't have any vasoconstriction, half of the blood, so 1.5 litres, is going to go through lung that is not being oxygenated, it's not going to take part in um, gas exchange, and therefore it's going to fall into the left side of the heart without getting any oxygen in. The other half is going to get oxygen. So, therefore, you're going to be mixing all this deoxygenated blood with oxygenated blood, and it's going to be half of it oxygenated, half of it deoxygenated. So you can see immediately how you're going to get much lower saturations because of the lack of um, the sh uh, blood being shunted into the areas that are being ventilated appropriately. With hypoxic vasoconstriction, what you're doing is that the half of the lung that isn't um, seeing any oxygen vasoconstricts. So now, rather than only 1.5 litres of blood going to the oxygenated part of the lung, the three litres start going through there. So all of the blood that is going into the lung is being oxygenated and coming back. So obviously your oxygen content in the blood is going to be that much larger and you're not going to get as much mixing of deoxygenated blood with oxygenated blood. There are certain pharmacological methods to try and match oxygenation a bit better with areas that are ventilated. If you imagine you're breathing in gas, well, by definition, the gas that comes into the alveolus has to have um, has to be oxygenated because it's coming in and out of the patient. <clears throat> if you add into that gas something that causes phasodilation, now when that gas sits in the alveolus, 
it's going to cause vasodilation of the pulmonary capillaries that are around it and the arterioles around there. And by doing so, you're going to decrease the resistance through those blood vessels and therefore increase blood flow through those areas. So you can improve VQ matching, the ventilation and the perfusion being matched. And just like that example that I talked about, where you have half the lung which is not ventilated, half the lung that is ventilated, now, instead of having to rely on the hypoxic vasoconstriction of the bits that aren't being ventilated, you're preferentially vasodilating the areas that are being that are seeing the nitric oxide or the prostacyclin that you use as an inhaled gas in those ventilated bits of lung and therefore shunting more blood through ventilated bits of lung. This reduces the VQ mismatch, reduces the shunt through unoxygenated bits of lung and therefore can improve oxygenation quite significantly. And we are seeing in COVID that some of these patients are responding really well, at least in the early stages, to um, inhaled nitric oxide or prostacyclins. The final thing to consider is the alveolar blood interface. It is so vital to suction these patients, to get rid of the sputum, the alveolar casts, the pus that sits in the alveoli and in the bronchioles supplying the alveoli. By doing so, you're going to recruit up more and more alveoli and therefore improve the surface area of um, oxygenation that can occur. Now, a general principle in patients with um, severe respiratory failure is to dry them out. And what that does is it reduces the pulmonary edema, reduces the thickness of the alveolar wall and the capi alveolar capillary, and therefore improves oxygen diffusion across. Now, there is a big but in the management of COVID-19 patients. What we are finding is that there are two distinct pathologies. Certainly in ARDS-like um, diseases, Having the patient on the drier side is important. However, in early COVID, what we're finding is that by having them intravascular deplete, we are actually making these patients potentially worse and increasing rates of acute kidney injury and actually not affecting the underlying pathology and pathophysiology of what's going on. And we'll go through that in a lot more detail in a specific videos. So we talk about two different types of um, COVID-19 and I have got a specific video on each of these two different types or phenotypes of um, COVID. But in this video I'm just going to introduce them. So if you are interested please go on to the separate videos which specifically talk about each of these phenotypes in turn. Early COVID seems to have this picture, the so-called L-type or low-type um, COVID-19. Why it's called low-type, um, again, please go and see the specific video on L-type COVID-19 to get more information. But essentially, the pathophysiology seems to be one of vascular insufficiency. So again, if you look at this picture, rather than it being so much to do with the alveolus, it seems much more related to the blood supply to the alveoli. And there are three main things that seem to be happening. One, patients seem to be getting um, right ventricular dysfunction. Now there's lots of case reports of patients developing myocarditis, but actually even in the patients who aren't developing a frank myocarditis, there does seem to be some degree of right ventricular dysfunction. Now, if you remember before, I said that you need to have a good cardiac output for, for blood to be flowing into the lung to then be oxygenated and come out into the left side and then out into the rest of the body as oxygenated blood. If you get less effective right ventricular function, you can reduce lung perfusion. And by reducing lung perfusion, you can reduce oxygenation. It also seems to be quite a prothrombotic state and there's lots of evidence starting to come out that patients with COVID-19, especially in the early stages, are developing microthrombi and these may be <coughs> causing the alveolar capillaries not to be supplying 
ventilated, aerated bits of alveoli, and therefore increasing the shunt even more. And then there's this whole symptom complex of vascular um, dysregulation. This may be associated with the binding sites that uh, COVID-19 preferentially have for things like the ACE2 receptor. But certainly we're seeing that the hypoxic vasoconstriction and vasodilation of um, cap pulmonary capillaries and arterioles does not seem to be normal. And so again, you're going to be increasing the shunt. You're going to be increasing the amount of blood flowing through underventilated or unventilated bits of lung. And this is probably the reason why a lot of patients are coming in quite profoundly hypoxic and are not responding to high oxygen levels being given to them via face mask. The other phenotype that we're seeing is the so-called H-type or high type of COVID. This has a different pathophysiology and you can already start to see that we have to treat these two phenotypes in a different way. In H-type this is much more similar to what you are getting with ARDS. This is a consolidative infiltrative process and so you're getting sputum pl plugging, inflammatory exudates inside the alveoli and thickening of the alveolar and vascular walls through inflammation and exudates coming in. So in these patients, actually using higher peeps to try and recruit up more alveoli, trying to dry the patient out to reduce the wall edema and therefore reduce the distance for the al for the oxygen to go from the alveolus into the blood supply is important. Things like chest physio become more important, removing alveolar casts and things that we do sometimes see in these patients and a regular suctioning of these patients may be helpful in trying to improve the number of alveolar units that are open and to get rid of that sputum plugging. So in summary, I hope that I've sort of given you an idea of why patients are hypoxic. The fact that there's only really four things that affect oxygenation. And so if you can improve any one or all of those things, you're going to improve your patient. That there is a spectrum of disease, but the two phenotypes that seem to be most prominent is the L type, which often occurs early on in disease, and the H type, which tends either to occur hyperacutely or to occur um, later on in the disease process. Because there's different pathophysiologies, the treatments are very different. Now, I only just barely touched on these, but I'm going to go into a huge amount of detail about each of these phenotypes in separate videos. So if you are interested, please check those out.